We're going to continue with the book of James, and we're going to wrap up James chapter 4. So this will be part 3 of James chapter 4. And again, as we go through the book of James, there's great opportunity for us to see where we need to be tuned up. And and I see a lot of areas as I've been going through this for myself that I really need to work on. And so we all need to do that. Plus, it's a great short little book with lots of lots of things to put into practice that is great for disciple making. OK, so please use this book for that purpose. So let's go ahead and read the latter half of James chapter four, and then we'll talk about a few more points. So starting in verse eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Okay, so there's so many things we could talk about from the book of James. We're just hitting some major things. So there's still much more that we could talk about. Okay, but I do want to talk about the drawing near to God aspect because this is super important. And in fact, when I originally created a version of this teaching, it was when I was going to go speak to a group of people at um, like a recovery center. And so the book of James was one of the things that the founding fathers of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, had used as the foundation of the of AA and the 12 steps. So they used the book of James and Matthew chapter five, six and seven and the love chapter, which is first Corinthians chapter 13. And when people put those sections of the Bible into practice, then they have life transformation. And that's a great thing to do. And it's all about drawing near to God. Okay, so let's just reread verse 8 and 9. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Okay, so let's talk about this. So our primary objective in life needs to be drawing near to God and remaining there. In God, we find the answer to all of life's problems and needs. We'll find love, freedom from bondage of any kind, whether it be sin, addiction, oppression, captivity, sickness, uh, physical and mental health, we'll find in God. Um, health and healing, we'll find protection, provision, purpose in life, fulfillment, and the list goes on, right? So when we draw near to God, then all these things belong to us, plus all the fruit of the Spirit, plus physical blessings in the present life, plus blessings of eternal life. So there's just a whole portfolio of goodness and blessing that happens when we're drawn near to God, okay? And so how do we draw near to Him? Okay, well, from the Scripture above, we can see um, the drawing near is, is on us, right? Okay, so the work is on our side of the equation. So God... He's already done his work. He loves us. He sent Jesus to this earth. Jesus is the answer to our problems. And so as we seek and find Jesus, then we're going to start the process. And then there are certain things that we need to do to continue to draw near to God. Okay. So as we're drawing near to him, then he's drawing near to us. So as we move to him, he's moving to us. And the converse is true too. If we're, if we're doing ungodly things, then we're going to kind of push him away. So it's not that God leaves us. It's that we we draw near or we push him away. So the drawing near and the pushing away is on us. So he says that we need to cleanse our hands, you sinners. So that means if, if we're in sin, then we need to walk away from it. We need to cleanse our hands of it. And we need to purify our hearts from it. Okay? Because when we've been in sin, then we're going to have a guilty conscience. And even though we may be born again, and even though we may know and believe in the promises of God, if we're busy 
committing sin, then we're going to have a tainted heart. We're going to have guilt feelings, and a guilty heart is going to be weak in faith or have no faith at all because we don't feel worthy, right? So it's not that God's like holding back from us, but our own conscience, if it condemns us, then that's going to cause a problem for us, and it's going to be difficult to have answers to prayer because of that guilt feeling. So we need to cleanse our hands, get out of the sin. Then we need to do certain things to purify our heart, namely confession and turning away from the sin. And then we also need to focus on not being double-minded. You know, we can be stuck on the fence about certain things. You know, maybe we're thinking worldly about a topic one minute and then faithfully about a topic another minute. So we're kind of like wavering back and forth. Um, it could be that we're wavering back and forth about, you know, do I go to the doctor or do I, do I stand in faith for this healing? Do I do this or do I do that? You know, so there's this double-mindedness that we need to be purged of and we need to get rid of all those doubts. Like double-mindedness, it's doubt. And so we get rid of double-mindedness by first making a decision that we want to live in faith and that we want to draw from God, not from the world. Okay, then we need to do Bible study on those subjects. Then we need testimonies on those subjects. And then we just need to align our words and actions. So that's how we would deal with double-mindedness. So I didn't really get into that in this particular teaching. Okay, but then he says, lament and mourn and weep. Okay, I really don't like that. <laughs> lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your and your joy to gloom. Yeah, I, I really don't like that, right? So James is being very just bold. And apparently in the setting he was in, there were some serious problems that he had to come against. And so he's coming against those problems. Okay, so he's basically saying that there's people there that they're deep in sin. And, and then, you know, he goes on, like in the later chapter, he, he goes on to talk about people that are, extorting others and taking advantage of others and defrauding others for for riches so one of the things he's coming against are greedy people greedy selfish sinners and what we need to do um, one aspect of turning from sin is we may need to get to a point where our life is miserable you know we're, we're deep in sin our life has become miserable and then we are lamenting and then we are mourning and then we are weeping but then when this condition comes about then what does it do? People start looking for answers. People become willing to change. And so for many people, not for everyone, but many people have to get to this point of lamentation and mourning and weeping over how miserable their life has become. And I was one of those people. You know, I was so deep in sin, so deep in addiction that my life was miserable. It was empty. You know, I was just a disaster. And so my condition was I finally got bad enough that I was willing to turn from sin and turn to God. And like in AA, they'll call that hitting rock bottom. Some people have to hit the bottom. And, and then when they hit the bottom, then they're willing to change. But yeah, it reminds me, it reminds me of blessed are the poor in spirit too. Remember correct. we talked about that verse a few weeks ago. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So how do we draw near to God? Okay. So a few, just a few points here. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a lot to do, but it may be challenging to do it. Okay. So first of all, we need repentance from sin and acceptance of Jesus. And the, of course, the initial time we do that, that would be salvation, right? So we're turning from sin, we're accepting Jesus, we're born again. Okay, and as we just talked about, um, some people may need to get to a point of, of sorrow and remorse over sin and the consequences they're experiencing, and that will help facilitate the turning away from sin. Okay, but many people, they, they just know that they're just living their life, they're partying, they're doing whatever, they're living sinfully, and they have no mental connection that their sinful living is what's causing all the disaster in their life. Like in my case, I was living sinfully, and I was like, I just felt unlucky. You know, the, the dishwasher would just spill its guts all over the floor and flood, the bathtub would overflow, something else would break, the car would break, the house was breaking, everything was breaking, you know, things were falling apart, financial disaster. And I had no connection in my head that, hey, Bobby, all this sin that you're doing, it's bringing forth all this terrible consequence. Okay, so one of the things we can try and do with people, if, if we see somebody around us that's experiencing that, then we can, you know, try and give them a wake-up call. You, you know, you're sowing and reaping. You're committing all this sin, and it's causing all this ill effect in your life, and it can get even worse than that. So you, you need to make the connection and turn from this, Right. Um, so we want them to connect the dots between all the bad stuff, all the consequences that are happening in their life. We need them to connect the dots that it's going back to the sin that they're doing. Okay. 
Then secondly, um, confession of sins to God will cleanse our heart and cleanse our conscience, and that will enable effective faith. And a guilty conscience hinders faith or altogether just nullifies it. Okay, so if, and, and this doesn't have to be, this can be at any point in our faith life. You know, so if I commit a sin today, then the first thing I would do is I need to confess it to God, right? So I need to confess it to God and say, Father, you know, I did this thing. I know I shouldn't have done it. You know, please forgive me. You know, you know, sorry that I've done this. Help me to stay turned away from the sin. You know, so just confess it and, and ask him to help you with it. You know, if it's been problematic, ask him to help you. Ask him to prune you. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you more strongly. You know, just just talk to talk to your father and ask him to help you stay out of that thing. Amen. Okay, but confession that will immediately wash away that guilty conscience. Okay, and so that's super important because if we have a guilty conscience, not only are we vulnerable personally, but if I have a guilty conscience and you come to me asking for prayer, then I might be weak in faith or I have no faith at all to be able to help another person. So it's worse than, you know, it's bigger than I'm the only one affected by having a guilty conscience because the people I'm supposed to help, I'll be less effective or, or completely ineffective in helping them if I'm feeling guilty. Okay, so we need to keep our conscience clean for our own sake and for the sake of others. And of course, for the sake of God, because he wants us to live a clean life. Amen. Okay, the third thing to do is we need to recognize how we have hurt other people. Okay, and, and we should stay up to date on this. Okay, so if we hurt somebody, then what do we need to do? We need to promptly confess our sins to them, um, pray for one another and make amends to the best of our ability. Okay, so you may, um, you may have done some wrongs to a whole assortment of people like throughout your life. And if you haven't ever sought to confess your sins to them or make amends with them, then that may still be a problem in your heart. And so if that's the case, what you want to do is you want to just get a piece of paper, make a list of the people that, that come to your mind, that, you know, and, and pray and ask God to bring to your mind the people that you've hurt that, that amends need to be made with. Okay, and then make contact with them. And this is the scary part, right? It's, it's scary to make that list of people and to contact them and confess to them and pray for them and make amends. It's a scary thing to do. But if you pray and ask for boldness and motivation and confidence, you know, God will give it to you and then you'll carry it out. And then once you've done that, the person whom you've wronged, even if it was years ago, they're going to be blessed by what you have done. Plus your heart, you're going to get that lightweight feeling, you know, that weight is going to drop off of you. Okay. And so if we have some baggage from the past that needs to be dealt with, go ahead and deal with it. Okay. Then what you do from this point forward is whenever you do something wrong, you don't wait five, 10, 20 years before you make amends. But instead of that, um, as you make a mistake, promptly go and confess your sins to people, pray for them and make amends. Okay. And then your heart will stay clean your relationships will stay healthier and you won't build up a lot of baggage on your heart like we may have done in times past. Amen. Okay. And then a fourth thing that we want to do to draw near to God is we want to walk in love towards others as demonstrated by good works. Okay. So we want our life to be characterized by good works, continuously characterized by good works. And there's all multitude of ways you can do good works. You can volunteer your time. You can take food to the homeless. You can give clothes to people. There's a million things that you can do and you can pray and ask God and he'll give you ideas of what to do. Okay, but we want to be busy with good works. Okay. And then on that point of good works, I want to, I want to bring your attention. Let's go back to, let's go back a page and I want to look at verse 17 here. It says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Okay, so this is an important point because we talked about having a guilty conscience. Well, you can have a guilty conscience because of sins of commission. Uh, you have committed a sin. Someone committed adultery and they have a, a guilty conscience because they committed adultery. So there's a sin of commission. You did something wrong. But then there are sins of omission. And verse 17 is talking about that. 
Sins of omission are when you're not doing the good things that you know you should do. So, for example, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's somebody on the corner, like when you leave your house or at the red light and they're begging for food. And every day you just drive past them and drive past them. And they really do want food and we just ignore them. Okay, well, that is a sin of omission. We, You know that you should do good to them, but then you drive past them every single day and they just want food. So that's a sin of omission. We know that we should have fed them. We didn't feed them. And you can get a guilty conscience from that. Okay, so not only is their need not being fulfilled, but your conscience is, is going to hinder you from not doing good things that you know you should have done. And then, you know, again, you have a guilty conscience and that will hinder your faith. So just be aware that there are two kinds of sin, commission and omission. And either one of them will have a negative effect on us and also may have an effect on other people as well. Okay. Okay, then in Galatians chapter 6, this talks about sowing and reaping. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Okay, so remember in James he was talking about lament and mourn and weep. Okay, so where is this coming from? Okay, well... If somebody is deep in sin, then they're sowing to the devil. So they're doing evil sowing. They're planting seeds from the devil. I mean, think, think about it. When, you, when we're in sin, we are planting seeds from the devil in our life. And then that's going to lead to reaping evil. And that word evil is wide open. It could be trials and tribulation. It could be your car breaking. It could be your dishwasher breaking. It could your your bathtub overflowing, it could be sickness, it could be cancer, it could be death, who knows what it could be. But if we're sowing to the devil, we're going to reap from the devil. And and if we continue in it, then it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And as we're continuing to reap evil in our lives because we're living sinfully for the devil, we're going to start to experience this sorrow, this lament, mourning and weeping. We're going to begin to experience that. And then hopefully that will have its good work resulting in repentance, resulting in salvation, and then resulting in blessed life. Okay, so the sowing and reaping ideally will bring forth sorrow and repentance leading to salvation. Okay, now it's not God that's doing the evil to us. Obviously, it's the devil who does that. But God likes to take, you know, the consequence of that and convert it to good because, you know, he wants goodness for us. He wants us to repent. Amen? And it specifically makes that point in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It says, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Okay, so if all of our evil sowing and reaping results in sorrow in our life, and that sorrow leads to repentance, then that's a good thing, right? So in my case, it led to, it took a while, but uh, ultimately, all the sorrow in life, it did lead to repentance because somebody had to tell me, you know, you're experiencing all these problems because, you know, because of the sinful life you're living. That's why you're experiencing these problems. If you will turn to God, he will heal you. Okay. And so I had to have the connection made in my mind that the things I was experiencing, the negative things I was experiencing in life were the result of living sinfully, living unmercifully, you know, all that, all the evil way I was living was producing the bad things in life. And, and then I was made aware, if I turned to God, he would deliver me. And so I did. So my sorrow was turned into repentance, and then that resulted in salvation. Amen? And so I don't regret the past, um, but now I have a new life. You know, we are new creations. So we don't have to dwell on who we were, because who we were is not who we are. We were old, old creations. We were sinful creatures. We had a sinful nature. But once we're born again, we are a new creation in Christ. I mean, literally, if somebody were to give us a polygraph test and ask us, Bobby, did you ever do this thing? And it was something, some crime or whatever I'm, I may have committed before salvation, I should be able to answer, no, I did not do that and pass the polygraph. Why? Because that, that's, that person is dead. The old man has been crucified with Christ. Now I am a new creation, right? I am a new creation. That The person who committed those things in the past they're dead, they're gone, they're crucified. So literally, I should pass a polygraph test if somebody asked me, did I do such and such? 
um, before salvation. Amen. That's how much we're forgiven. That's how much we are a new creation. Okay, then there's multiple passages that talk about the importance of confession. And we talked about confession is important for, you know, for purifying your heart. We want to draw near to God. We need to purify our hearts. And Proverbs chapter 28 says, The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Okay, so if we want to prosper in life, then we need to we need to confess our sins. We need to confess them and we need to turn away from them. And then we will find mercy and then we will begin to prosper in life and then we will be drawing near to God. Amen? So we can't harbor like guilt of sin in our hearts because, well, it's going to render you ineffective and it's going to keep God at a distance from you. You know, you're, you're keeping yourself at a distance from God would be a better way to say it. When you confess your sins, you're clearing away all that, all that baggage that's between you and God. You're clearing it away. You're clearing away the guilt. You're able to draw near to him. And that's exactly what we want. So if we do make a mistake, just confess it. Just right away, confess it, turn away from it, and you'll have mercy and you'll continue to prosper in life. Your faith will be effective and you'll be able to walk in personal victory and you'll be able to help others effectively being in full assurance of faith. Amen. Okay. In James, it talks about the same thing. Like in the next chapter, chapter 5, 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Okay, so this is talking about the same concept. If we've sinned against a person, confess your sin to them and then pray for one another. And that will result in, in healing of whatever kind you need. It, you know, you may need healing in your soul. Like, for example, many people that have like compulsive disorders, like let's just say an eating disorder. They're like addictively eating or they have addiction of other kind, like they're addictively drinking or doing drugs or having sex or whatever. A lot of people are in bondages like that because of because of sin against others and because of lack of mercy towards other people. Okay, and so if we've done something wrong against someone else, we need to cleanse our heart from that by confessing our sin to them and praying for them, and then also try to make amends to, to the best of your ability. Okay, and that's gonna that's gonna take away that baggage pertaining to the wrongs that you have done. Okay, another aspect we'll talk about later on is we need to be forgiving of other people when they've done us wrong because harboring resentment towards other people, okay, when if I were to have a resentment towards you, it doesn't it doesn't affect you at all. But for me, it, like resentment is there's a saying that goes resentment is resentment is like wishing for another person to die but you drink the poison and it only kills you. Okay, so you're wishing, you resent somebody, you wish them to die, and that is poison for you. So you're wishing them to die, but you're you're drinking poison to yourself. So resentment is not hurting them, it's only killing you. So we want to be walking in grace and mercy towards others, forgiveness towards others. And we'll talk about that when we get into chapter 5. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, 23, it's also talking about making amends. So Jesus said, so if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Okay, so it's so important from God's perspective that we seek to do right in our relationships. That he's saying, even if you go to church and you know, you're know you coming to church, you're coming to see me, God, in the church, and then you remember, hey, your brother has something against you. Just come back to me in a minute. First, go and make amends with your brother and then come back to the church. So he, God is actually telling us that we need to prioritize fixing the relationships in our life. You know, go, go and make amends. Go and right this wrong. Do it quickly and then come back. You know, so it's so important to him that he wants you to first do that and then come back to him. Amen? So... So if we've made mistakes, again, let us not 
let time pass by and let it pass by and let it pass by like we did in the past. But if we make a mistake and hurt somebody, fix it immediately. As soon as you recognize what you've done, seek to fix it immediately. That way your heart will be clean. That way their heart will be clean because they may be resenting you and that would be bad for them. And we don't want that to happen to them. And we don't want to have guilt of having harmed them either. Okay, so this is going to help both parties by making amends. Okay, then the next thing I want to talk about is this concept of our heart condemning us and the effect it has on faith. So in 1 John 3, 21 to 23, it says, Beloved, if, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Okay, so we are New Testament people, and you can summarize everything that's expected of us in one word. So the only command we have is one word, it's to love. Okay, so we need to you know, believe in Jesus, we need to love Jesus, and we need to love one another. So if we love God, and if we love one another, then we're gonna fulfill um, the commandment that Jesus has given to us. His commandment to us is love. Love God and love your neighbor. That's it. Okay. Now, if our heart does not condemn us, then we will have confidence. In other words, we will have effective faith in God. And then whatever we pray for, we're going to receive it. Okay. So I think we would all like to be in a place like that, that whatever we're asking, we receive just boom, 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 just like clockwork. You know, prayers answered after prayer after prayer. That's good. That's what God wants, right? Okay. But it says, if our heart does not condemn us. Now, if we've been doing things we shouldn't be doing like if we have harmed our brother and we haven't made it right if we've committed some other kind of sin and we haven't confessed it um, if we keep driving past a hungry person every day and we're not helping them then guess what our heart will be condemning us and then that means the opposite of this will be true um, we will be weak in faith towards god and whatever we ask we will not receive from him if our heart is condemning us okay so in order to have an effective faith life, you know, if for no other reason, okay, in order to have an effective faith life, we need to keep our heart clean. Okay, and so there's steps we can take to cleanse our heart. It's better just to, to not do anything to mess your heart up. Okay, that's the best. That's where we should be. But if we do make mistakes, then we need to correct them immediately so that our heart is cleansed. Amen. And then we're going to be rich in faith. We're going to have effective prayer life and things will be good, and then we'll also be good for the kingdom of God, and we'll be delivering benefit to many other people as well. Okay? All right, then the last thing is once we've gone through this process and continue in it, so this should be a lifestyle. He's like B, C, and D should be a lifestyle. Okay, you know, salvation, that happens once, but anytime we make a mistake, confess to God. If we hurt another person, immediately confess to them seek to make amends, and be constantly walking in love. So this should be our like love walk, right? B, C, and D. We should be walking this way all the time. So once we've gone through this process of, of cleansing our heart and we continue in it on a daily basis, we will have thoroughly cleansed our hands and purified our hearts. We will experience close relationship with God and we'll, we will see our spiritual life come alive, such as through continuous answered prayers. Amen? So this is really important. This is also the foundation of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. They seek to cleanse away the past, all the wrongs you've done in the past, cleanse your heart, walk in love. And then once you do that, then, you know, it's easy to be free from addiction and sin when you're living right. Okay, let's go on. God also tells us that he doesn't want us to judge one another. In James 4, 11 to 12, he says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Okay, so the point is that God does not want us to judge one another. He does not want us to speak evil of other people. And he does not want us to retaliate against people who've done wrong to us. Okay? Because generally speaking, if we're speaking evil of someone, 
um, may, perhaps they've done something wrong to us, right? And so we're judgmental towards them. We're complaining about them. We're speaking evil about them because they've done something wrong to us. Well, God doesn't want us to repay evil with evil. He doesn't want us to be judge, judging of them and speaking evil of them and retaliating, retaliating against them. Okay, instead of that, let us keep a couple of thoughts in mind. So first of all, God wants us to be merciful to others just as he has been merciful to us. Okay, so forgiveness is the key to mercy, right? So if we think about what Jesus has done for us, the greatest thing he ever did is that while we were deep in sin, while we were separated from him, while we didn't love him or even think about him, so all the sinful world before Jesus, and he loved us so much that he died for us, and gave us forgiveness of sin. And that allows us to be rescued out of the devil's kingdom and authority and be brought into God's kingdom and his authority. Okay, so the greatest thing Jesus ever did that enables everything else is he forgave us our sins. When we accept him, our sins are forgiven. He paid for it. So forgiveness is the greatest gift of God. And, and that's the starting point of all the other benefits. And so if... if so if the greatest thing God did for us was forgiveness, then the greatest thing we can do for others is also forgiveness. And one of the worst things we can do is to not be forgiving. One of the worst things we can do is to not be merciful. Because these are the hallmark characteristics of God. Forgiveness and mercy. That's the starting point of everything with God. Amen? So since his greatest gift to us was was mercy and forgiveness, our greatest action towards others also needs to be mercy and forgiveness. You know, forgiveness, I mean, this can be challenging and it's kind of hard to think about it sometimes. What exactly is forgiveness? Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetness. Forgiveness doesn't mean you forget what they've done. Forgiveness means you will no longer hold it against them. If Let's just say somebody does something wrong to me, and every time I get in a conversation with them, I'm bringing up what they did. You know, why should I do this for you? For you, Remember when you did such and such to me? And then the next time I talk to them, remember when you did this to me? Why should I do anything for you? Why should I help you? Remember when you did that? Like, so somebody who's unforgiving, they're always resurrecting the sin of the other person. Like, they're always resurrecting. So unforgiveness is constantly thinking about the wrong things that this other person has done. And they're always resurrecting it. They're always reminding the person, bringing up the past. Remember when you did this to me? Remember when? You... Okay, so that's a person who's walking in unforgiveness. They have not let go of that thing. Okay, but forgiveness is making a decision. Okay, you may not, there's not always like some special feeling that you get, but it's an action. Forgiveness is an action. I decide to take an action. I decide to be forgiving. And if I decide to be forgiving, then that means I'm going to stop reminding you of every wrong thing you've done to me. And if I make a decision to forgive you, then that means I will quit resurrecting all of your sins. I will let them go. That doesn't mean I've forgotten them, but I'm not going to keep bringing them up and holding them against you. I have to let them go. Let them be in the past. That's the past. Today's a new day. Okay. So the major thing is quit resurrecting their sins. That's, that, is the, that is the foundation of forgiveness. Quit resurrecting their sins. Okay, then you may have to retrain your mind. Like, so if you keep thinking about this bad thing that they did to you, okay, but you're not reminding them of it anymore, so that's good. That's the starting point. But you need to start casting down that bad thought that comes every time you think about them. You need to start casting that down. And when... You know, when you cast down that evil thought or evil remembrance of them, pray for them also. Just pray blessing over them. And so over time, that unforgiveness towards them, first of all, you're going to quit holding it against them verbally and in other ways. And then secondly, every time you remember their sin, even if you don't speak it, once you pray for them, then your heart's going to soften towards them. Okay, so they're going to be blessed and your heart's going to be blessed. So that's how forgiveness works. Okay, we also need to be careful, like like mercy. A lot of times we can, I don't know, like maybe there's an event on the news and somebody did some terrible thing and you'll hear people say they need to like, I don't know, they need to put that person to death. They need to do this. They need to do that. They need to just prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. And that's like a, that's what the flesh wants 
to do. Like our human flesh, it wants to retaliate, it wants revenge, it wants to repay that child molester with like a slow, torturous death, to, you know, to come upon them or whatever, right? So people think that way, that's the way the flesh thinks, okay? But God wants us to be merciful towards others, okay? So just rather than throwing the book at somebody, allow room for mercy, right? So ultimately, what do you want? I mean, harming somebody equally or greater than what they've harmed you, that doesn't necessarily change anything. You might have some little satisfaction that they suffered some pain, but is that really what you want? I mean, isn't what we really want the kind of result that Jesus got with the man at the Gadarenes? So remember, remember when they came to the Gadarenes, there was the man living in the tombs and he was fierce. He was violent. No one could tame him. Um, he would break chains and he would break shackles. He was unbindable, unchainable, untamable. He was just fierce and violent. He was perverse. He was running around naked. He was crazy. He was out of his mind. He was crying out. He was suicidal. He was cutting himself with stones. I mean, so this guy was a disaster, right? Okay, well, you know, what would we, you know, if we were unmerciful, we'd say just, you know, lock him up in a stronger prison, throw away the key and just be done with him. You know, that would be the unmerciful approach. Okay, but then nothing ever changes. There's no good that comes from that other than maybe a person's not harmed, but there's no greater good that comes. But what did Jesus do? Jesus cast the demons out of the guy. And then as soon as he cast the demons out of the guy, it says that he was sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and he wanted to follow Jesus. Now, isn't that a better outcome? And so if we just go the unmerciful past, uh, path, then there's a huge benefit that's not going to happen because they're, we just have them locked up or we put them to death or whatever thing we want to do to that criminal. There's not going to be a good outcome, like a greater good outcome. But if we can be merciful, if we can seek to get them delivered, you know, pray for their repentance, you know, ultimately if a person repentance, repents and turns to Jesus, then that's a million times better than just locking them up in prison forevermore. Amen? Because once they're transformed and born again in a new creation, that evil, sinful, mean person that they once were, that's, that person's dead and gone. And now you have a beautiful, lovable son or daughter of God. And that's the best result. And that can only happen through mercy. Amen? Okay, secondly, we should pray for people who do wrong to us. And Jesus told us to bless our enemies. We should do good to our enemies rather than repay them with vengeance. Okay, so this um, whole page is really about, you know, it's, it's, I'm coming at it from the perspective, if somebody has done wrong to us, we want to respond differently than what we may have done in the past. We need to respond differently than how our flesh wants us to respond. So when we do good to people who have done wrong to us, rather than, you know, us doing evil to them, one of two things will happen. Okay. Either the goodness of God will lead to their repentance or their continuation in sin will push them further and further away from God and ultimately they will sow and reap their way into all kinds of problems, sickness, death, and destruction from the devil. And you know that would be the sorrow, the lamenting, and mourning that we read about on the previous page. Okay, I want to read Romans 2.4. It says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Amen? So if we really want to bring about somebody's repentance, the person who's been harming us, we need to do good to them. And that's probably one of the hardest things to do in our Christian life. Um, but it's something that we all need to pray about and we all need to grow in and we need to put into practice. I'm sure as we start blessing our enemies rather than hating upon them or retaliating, it's going to become easier and easier to just automatically repay evil with good. Okay? And that's what God wants from us. Okay, so let's talk about forgiveness. So in Matthew 6, 14 to 15, it says, For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you do not forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. Okay, so this can be confusing because we're like, well, didn't Jesus pay for my forgiveness of sins? Yes, he did. Okay, so the first thing that we needed is we needed salvation. We needed to have, okay, because of sin, we were separated from God in the beginning. Because of sin, 
the devil has legal authority over people who are not born again. Because if there's sin in you, then the devil has something in you, and he owns you. Okay, so when Jesus washes away your sin, then you are redeemed out of the kingdom of darkness because the devil loses his authority over you. When your sin is washed away by the blood of Jesus, the devil loses his authority over you. Okay, so that's that's when salvation occurs. Okay, so you can be born again, but if you're walking in unforgiveness, then you're just putting a wedge, you're building a wall between you and Father God. It's not him that's doing anything to you, but your unforgiveness towards other people, you're, that's sin. Unforgiveness is one of the greatest sins we can commit because it's one of the greatest gifts that Jesus gave us, the greatest. So if we are unforgiving of others, then we are sinning and we are pushing God away. Okay, just like this passage says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Okay, how do you do that? By cleansing your hands from sin. Okay, well, if we're indulging in sin, such as unforgiveness, then what are we doing? We're doing the opposite and we're pushing God away. So as we're... As we're walking in unforgiveness towards others, then we're pushing God further and further away. Okay, and let me give like a, a like a worldly analogy here. So let's just say, let's equate our salvation to a person, a husband, uh, a man and a woman getting married. Okay, so in the beginning, the man and the woman they love each other and they get married. Okay, and we'll equate that to somebody being born again and receiving salvation. Okay, so things are good, and then, um, then something happens and they start being unforgiving of one another. And so they're building a wall between each other. And so maybe they're still living in the same house, but they're no longer sleeping in the same bedroom. So one sleeping in one bedroom, the other sleeping in the other bedroom. And, you know, they're still in the same house. They're still married, um, but they've, they've separated from one another because there's something between them. There's sin between them. There's unforgiveness between them. There's something wrong in the relationship. And so they have they're still together, they're still married, which is a permanent thing, but yet they're not talking, they're not communicating, and they're living in other corners of the house. Okay, well, that's kind of the same scenario here. It's not that the person, you know, loses their salvation or anything like that, but they have separated themselves by way of sin, separated themselves, gone to the other side of the house from Father God, and they're not getting all the benefits of being in a good relationship with Father God. Okay, so we have pushed away. So when we start to be forgiving, then we start to draw near again. Okay, so it's, it's very important for us to be merciful and be forgiving. And again, this is one of the more challenging things that we have to do. And, and an aspect of forgiveness is doing what Jesus tells us in chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, so Jesus is giving us very specific instructions. So if we're judging somebody, if we're speaking evil of somebody, they probably have done something wrong to us, and our inclination would be to hate them and to do wrong to them because that's what the flesh wants to do. But he says that we need to love our enemies and pray for them and, and bless them. Amen? So this is what we need to put into practice. So if we identify that there's people in our lives that we're having feelings of unforgiveness or resentment towards, then... Start by praying for them. Pray for them every day until that ugly feeling inside of you goes away. Do something good for them. You know, find some way to love upon them. Find some good deed to do for them. And this is the perfection of God. You know, if you read on in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus describes the perfection of Father as the fact that he loves the good and he loves the evil. He blesses the good and he blesses the evil. And Jesus said, therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the perfection he was talking about is that Father God has the ability to love and bless good people and evil people. And so perfection, like we know that we are like really mature when, spiritually speaking, when we're able to bless our enemies. And so that's something that we really need to aspire to do and put into practice. Amen? And when we do that, not only does it cleanse our heart, but it's also going to bring about change inside of them. And that's tied to this passage here in Romans chapter 12. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so the, the wording of this passage can kind of throw us off and take us down a wrong path. Like, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Okay, but how is he actually repaying? Okay, what is he actually instructing us to do? He's instructing us to bless our enemy. And remember, in Romans chapter 2, so earlier in the same book, it says, um, the goodness of God leads people to repentance. The goodness of God, his goodness, he, he repays evil with good. And that repayment of evil with good brings about repentance. Okay, so when it says, like when you're feeding your enemy, when you're giving your enemy a drink, it says you're heaping coals of fire on his head. This is coals of fire, it's conviction. It's like, um, this is like conviction to turn away from the evil and to repent from the evil and to turn to good. That's, the, that's what it's talking about. You will heap coals of fire of conviction to change, conviction to repent. You will heap this conviction of repentance upon his head. Amen? And that's the result that you want. Then, by doing that, you overcome evil with good. Amen? So I would encourage all of you to get a good example of this. I think it's in 2 Kings. I'm not sure what chapter, but in 2 Kings, there's a story about Elisha and how he took the entire Syrian army captive, and then he blessed them, fed them, gave them a feast, and then it says they never attacked Israel again from that moment because he blessed the enemy. So go find that passage about Elisha and Gehazi and read it, and then you'll get a good example of the good fruit that happens when we put this in practice, this loving of enemies. Amen? All right, so we're going to end there today. So any comments or questions?